Thanks, Massey. And thanks for two other things. One, reminding us that complexity control is the central problem in writing and operating software in the real world. And two, for reminding me that Jenga is a lot more fun when it doesn't directly relate to our technology stack. After security, the next sign of a maturing cloud native industry is the focus on automation and on reducing complexity. With that in mind, I introduce the legendary John Seeger as he walks us through updates in Juju over the last six months and a look towards what's coming up in the next six to 12. So thanks very much, David. Uh, uh, I'm John Seeger. I'm the Vice President of Engineering for Enterprise Solutions at Canonical, which functionally means that I look after the development of Juju, the operator framework, and most of the charm teams that work at Canonical, um, some of which you'll have already heard about today. They include the data platform team, the observability team, the Kubeflow team, the identity team, and a couple of others as well. Um, today, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about um, why you would use Juju, a bit of a recap, um, and kind of where we're positioned by comparison to some of the other tools on the market. I'm also going to give you a bit of a view as to what we've been working on for the last six months and what we're hoping to develop over the next six months to a year or so. Um, you can continue to ask questions in the chat. You can also ping me on Twitter. My handle is just at the bottom of that first slide. Um, so what I'll do is I'll just first get started as to why Juju, what is a charmed operator, uh, and what kind of benefits can it bring to your business? So firstly, I think it's worth just uh, taking a bit of a, a breather to think about the evolution of open source in the market over the last few years. So open source has arguably become almost a new mainstream. There's never been so much choice of genuinely world-class applications and services that have been made available through the open source world. Um, if you need a relational database or a document database or a metric scraper, or you need to do machine learning, you need an IDE, uh, you need infrastructure as code tools, you can almost guarantee in almost any category of software that you're going to find an open source contender. And often the open source contenders are as good or, or even better than some of the enterprise offerings. Um, one of the biggest differences um, that's happened over the last few years is lots more organizations, as well as individuals, are recognizing the benefits of open sourcing their code. If you just think about the success of Linux itself, of databases like Postgres, IDEs like Visual Studio Code, dashboarding tools like Grafana, these have become almost household names uh, for a lot of tech people and even for a lot of non-tech people as well. However, deploying applications has almost become the easy part. There are plenty of tools on the market that can help you deploy applications, be those Terraform or Helm or Ansible. Um, you pick your poison. There are lots of applications that can deploy other applications. The difficulty comes where you know, applications are more than just a single service. Most complex applications are not just composed of a single component. You'll often need databases, caches, event queues, indexes, um, an observability stack, uh, and various other tools to be composed with. Uh, for each of those things, you'll have to figure out how to configure them individually, how to join them together, uh, which is hard enough on just one system or one cloud but gets really, really difficult if you're trying to kind of juggle that across public clouds, private clouds, hybrid clouds, all at once. Even if you get that sorted, the hard work really begins when you start operating and supporting your software in production. So your day two onward story gets really, really complicated where you're kind of rolling your own and combining lots and lots of different tools. Uh, how can you guarantee that your automation is going to evolve as the underlying cloud platforms change? Uh, part of the great thing about the public clouds, for example, is that they're constantly introducing new features, new integrations. But as a result of that, their APIs often change. And so it's quite easy for your shiny infrastructure as code repository to become stale over the course of just a couple of months. So you're going to need someone who maintains your infrastructure as code. You're going to need someone who tests constantly the integration between the various components and that you can recover your environment. Uh, and you're also going to need to make sure that it's observed and that the various new tele telemetry formats are, for, are being used. There's also the ongoing problem that's been a problem in the industry forever of how you ensure that your estate is patched for security vulnerabilities, not just in the uh, underlying infrastructure, but also the applications that you use, be that Postgres or MongoDB or, or whatever it is that your stack is using. 
So I present to you Juju as a tool that you can use to deploy any application at any scale on any platform or architecture on any substrate, where substrate is a, a cloud of some sort. We support all kinds of different substrates, be that bare metal, be that conformant, uh, CNCF conformant Kubernetes, OpenStack, uh, Amazon Web Services, Google Cloud, Azure, Oracle Cloud, VMware, Equinix, and a couple of others as well. So you can use Juju almost wherever you've got cloud estate. You can generally use the exact same charm, the exact same package for an application on lots and lots of different substrates, which gives you really, really great portability for your workloads. And critically, because we support so many different platforms, and because the world is just increasingly getting more complex and the cloud APIs keep changing, with Juju, you just get to learn one set of tools. You learn how to deploy something with Juju, Juju will carry on working in the background and evolving itself to make sure that you can keep building and running your infrastructure. One of the really, really interesting things about Juju is just how flexible it is. Uh, this illustration gives you an idea of just a, a handful of different ways that you might deploy a, albeit relatively contrived, application stack. So at the top of each of these stacks, you'll see Prometheus, Postgres, and Kafka. On the very far left, you can see that we've built a Kubernetes cluster on top of AWS EC2. So we've deployed a Kubernetes cluster on top of EC2 with Juju. And then on top of that Kubernetes cluster, we've deployed Prometheus, Postgres, and Kafka. Coming along one, we start with Canonical Maz, which is a bare metal provisioner. On top of our bare metal, we've deployed OpenStack with Juju. We've taken that OpenStack and deployed Kubernetes on it with Juju. And then we've taken the Kubernetes and deployed our apps on that with Juju. In the Azure example, we've just deployed the application straight to virtual machines on Azure. And on the far right, you can see that we've just deployed the application straight to a conformant Kubernetes, perhaps MicroKates, perhaps K3S, perhaps pick, you know, pick your poison. The point is that you can compose Juju and the charms that we provide through Charm Hub in lots and lots of different ways, which gives you really, really, uh, a lot, gives you a lot of flexibility in how you build your infrastructure. The, po the point here is that the charmed operators uh, on Charm Hub are mostly fundamentally designed to be composed to solve problems. The whole idea behind Juju in the first place was around integrating applications and providing a layer on top of world-class open source to make sure that your day one, day two, day two plus operations are really, really seamless. One benefit of adopting Juju across multiple clouds is its portability. This has been a promise of configuration management tools and infrastructure as code tools for a really, really long time. This is as close as I've personally seen to that reality. Uh, I've done quite a lot of work with Ansible, quite a lot of work with Terraform, some work with CloudFormation. And one of the things that really strikes me about Juju is quite how portable charms are. You can take the exact same charm for Postgres, for example, deploy it on AWS, and deploy that exact same charm on Azure with the same command. It's just due to deploy Postgres on Azure, on AWS, on uh, Kubernetes, on GCP, on MXD, on OpenStack. It, it is literally just always the same. The only, the only nick in that armor is that right now we have two classes of charms. We have a class of charms for deploying on machines and we have a class of charms for deploying on Kubernetes. But the Kubernetes charms will work on any Kubernetes and the machine charms will work on any machine, whether that's a bare metal machine in your own private data center or it's a virtual machine in the public cloud. This gives engineers, SREs, analysts, et cetera, the choice to deploy the most cost-effective or resource rich cloud, or even just the most commercially suitable cloud. And if that commercial engagement changes or the cost changes and you need to move your workloads, you can move them with the exact same charms. Juju supports model migration even between different clouds. So you can literally pick a deployment up from one of your databases in Azure and move it to AWS if you wish. We have a whole great, whole number of great applications in Charm Hub. So a good number of these Canonical are working on themselves, but there's also some community contributed examples among this list. These are generally first class applications from the open source world. The Charm Hub itself provides quite a rich interface for finding those applications, reading the documentation for those applications, understanding the configuration, understanding which other charms they can integrate and how, understanding what the day two actions that are available are, and the Charm Hub is fully integrated with the developer tooling. So the same tool that you use for building your charms, Charmcraft, is also the tool that you use for publishing your charms to Charm Hub. 
In general, we like to think that charmed operators should be absolutely great on their own. But as I mentioned earlier on, one of the key value propositions for Juju is its kind of ability to provide a much, much higher level of integration between tools. And so if you take some of these uh, bundles as examples, you kind of get to see quite the value that Juju can add. Take Kubeflow, for example. Kubeflow is, in this case, a bundle of 30 plus microservices that can be deployed on Kubernetes. Each one of those microservices has its own unique configuration. There are various sets of them that need to be configured to talk to each other. The bundle also includes Istio and various other components. With Juju, you just get to Juju deploy Kubeflow on any CNCF conformant Kubernetes, and it just comes straight out of the box and works for you. The same can be said for our observability stack. So our observability stack is comprised of Prometheus, Grafana, Alert Manager, and Loki in its light form. And in the coming months, we'll begin adding support for Mimir as well and for more kind of high availability, friendly deployments. Uh, Magma is a tool that you can use for building and operating 5G mobile core networks. And the point is that each of these bundles is comprised of many, many different applications, um, often complex applications like databases that have uh, a lot of detail around how they should be scaled, where they should be deployed, how they should be configured. Um, and so, by using Juju, you get to abstract away all of that detail and just deploy your observability stack and then go ahead integrating that with the applications that you've deployed, whether that be a database or, or whatever. So I'd like to talk now a little bit about some of the work that the Juju team uh, has been doing over the last six months. The first big thing is that Juju 3.0 is now released. Um, this isn't a massive feature release. We've been kind of towing along Juju 2.9 for some time, and the time has come to kind of roll over into a major version, which allows us the opportunity to remove some of the kind of legacy code. We've done a massive overhaul on the kind of CI system and the testing system, which we're hoping is going to allow us to move much, much quicker in releases and more confidently in releases to make sure that we're not introducing breaking changes, the APIs are being maintained and that the release process generally goes much smoother. Um, one of the interesting points for me here is the hard work the Juju team has done on cleaning up the Juju code base. Juju is about to go through some fairly big transformations over the next couple of years, one of which is its data model. We're going to try and have less reliance on MongoDB and move to something a little bit lighter and um, easier to maintain to give Juju a kind of more of a snappy feel. And the groundwork has been laid in Juju 3.0 for that. Um, there is a new improved kind of actions user experience. Some of you might have opted into this already as a kind of behind a feature flag, but that's now the default in Juju 3.0. And we've also done a big review on the CLI commands that are available to make sure that they're as consistent as possible, as self-explanatory as possible, and that the help text provided in the CLI is, is as kind of in depth as it possibly can be. There's a few paper cut things that we've introduced as well. So there's a lot more colored terminal output by default now. So things will be a little bit easier to read when you're working with Juju. And like I said, we've also made a few deprecations. So with Juju 3.0, you'll no longer be able to deploy charms to Windows machines. Um, and you will also not be able to deploy charms to Xenial and Bionic based Ubuntu machines. While this might seem like a bit of a stark departure from Juju 2.9 and some of the previous releases, I think that by release uh, by removing some of this code, and, and by the way, it's a lot, like I say, we're something like hundred, just over 100,000 lines short of the last 2.9 release, it'll allow us to focus a little bit more on the really, really key parts of Juju's development that are coming up over the next few months. In the coming days, there'll also be a release roadmap being published on the Charm Hub, and the release roadmap will give you a much clearer idea of when the point releases are happening. So when Juju 3.1 is happening, Juju 3.2 is happening, when Juju 4 is happening, uh, and also how long we'll support each of those releases for. For those of you in the audience that are getting a bit itchy that I said we're no longer going to deploy Xenial and Bionic Charms, we are also committing to supporting Juju 2.9 as a sort of LTS release. And so we'll actually extend support for Juju 2.9 out to 2028. Um, we'd obviously encourage you to try and migrate your charms to the latest base you possibly can for a variety of reasons, including kind of security and performance, but we will stand by those deployments that, that already exist out there. Another project that I'm really excited about personally is a Terraform provider for Juju. So, um, what this enables you to do is essentially drive an existing Juju controller with Terraform. So if you have access to a Juju controller and you would like to create a model, deploy a charm, configure those charms, 
create relations between those charms or create cross-model relations between those charms, you can now drive that with Terraform. You might be wondering why we bothered doing this, given that we have some kind of crossover in functionality. And the answer is there are lots of enterprises that have already, already adopted Terraform. Terraform is good at some things. Juju is not so focused on those things. So for example, um, you wouldn't be using Juju to arbitrarily provision a VPC and a subnet and a virtual machine on EC2. That's not really how we've designed Juju to be used. Um, we've designed Juju to manage applications and the life cycle of those applications. You also wouldn't use Juju necessarily to provision DNS records into Route 53. You might not use it for uh, deploying a, a Lambda function. But all of these things are valid use cases. And uh, we wanted to enable users to be able to take full control of their cloud infrastructure using Terraform, create VPCs, deploy Lambda functions, you know, manage your DNS through Route 53, but also be able to use Juju to manage the lifecycle of applications uh, the way we see applications being managed. So this allows those users who have already adopted Terraform to trivially slot this into their existing kind of infrastructure pipeline and start, for example, taking, taking advantage of Kubeflow charmed Kubeflow as part of their existing AWS estate managed by Terraform or their existing Google estate or OpenStack estate, whatever it might be. As part of this project, we have to do quite a lot of work on the Juju API itself. So um, we've begun work on restructuring Juju's API to kind of decouple it from the client, which will open the door for more and more kind of third-party integrations. So if you're building an application that you think might be able to use Juju under the hood to deploy applications, then the story there is going to get a lot cleaner over time. And we're, we're also committed to building a lot more uh, kind of developer documentation for Juju itself. We've traditionally focused on providing developer documentation for charmed operators, but we also recognize that there are people who might want to just integrate Juju into their own product to take advantage of the capabilities it brings, deploying applications, managing them, etc. You can find all the docs for that on juju.is slash doc slash Terraform. It's also published into the Terraform registry. So if you head over to the Terraform registry and search Juju, you'll find the kind of fully formed docs there um, as you need. So I, I displayed this picture at the last operator day. This was kind of my view on how Juju secrets would evolve. With Juju 3.0, there will be the opportunity for you to kind of elect to enable Juju secrets. It will be behind a feature flag. By Juju 3.1, it will be generally available. So what is Juju secrets and why would you want to use them? For a long time, as, as developers, as SREs have deployed applications either into staging environments or into production, there has always been a need to manage secrets. Juju has been a little bit weak here. So we've generally relied upon third party tools like HashiCorp Vault um, or kind of more primitive mechanisms for sharing secrets around. Perhaps you might have an integration with Azure Key Vault or something like that. This feature brings native support for a whole new primitive, a secret inside Juju itself. So we're working on three separate backends. The one that we've implemented first is the controller backend. So that is you would essentially create a secret using the Juju CLI. That secret would be stored in the controller database. It would get its own ID. It would be tied to an application. And that will enable charm developers to, for example, when you, in this example, we have a Postgres and a Mattermost. If you integrate Postgres and Mattermost, then Postgres can create a database for that Mattermost instance, create a secret for that database that holds the database password and user, and then hand that secret over by reference to the Mattermost charm, which can then query the Juju controller and say, hey, I think I'm supposed to get a secret. Am I, am I allowed to access it? Can you give me the value? We've implemented it in such a way that the back end is completely kind of hot swappable. So um, we have early code that you'll be able to opt into on a kind of feature flag basis that would allow you to use the Kubernetes secrets backend. Um, the benefit of doing that when you're on Kubernetes is that if you have a kind of CSI driver or you have an integration, for example, where you're on uh, Azure Kubernetes service and you're using Key Vault to store your secrets encrypted, if you use the backend, the Kubernetes backend for Juju secrets, when your charm creates a secret, it will automatically end up being stored in the Key Vault. So if you have kind of Kubernetes native integrations for managing your secrets, using the Kubernetes backend allows you to take full advantage of that straight away. We're also going to implement the HashiCorp Vault backend uh, for which there are charmed operators. So you can deploy HashiCorp Vault on machines or on Kubernetes using charms, and then you can tell the controller to use that for secret storage too. Um, that's particularly useful if you're in an environment where you need to do kind of dynamic secret provisioning or you have some regulatory um, 
compliance issues such that you need to use something like an HSM, for example, which Vault will allow you to do. Um, one of the key things I think that this brings is, it firstly, brings kind of a common language. So you can manage secrets in the exact same way, whether you're on AWS, whether you're on Azure, on Kubernetes, it'll just be the Juju commands for creating, rotating, retiring secrets. And critically, we've built in very early on a mechanism for charms to, to swap secrets in a secure manner, right? So they only ever exchange IDs and the kind of access control on those secrets is all managed by the controller. So what are we working on next? I think over the next few months, there are some really, really exciting features that we're working on. Um, some of them won't be visible straight away. So one is the data model transition that I mentioned um, a few slides back. So this is fundamentally reducing our reliance on MongoDB, which is in itself a big complex distributed system in many cases. Um, and I think by moving elements of our data model to something smaller and more lightweight, we can make large Juju controllers, firstly, more performant, and thus consume less resources and more cost effective, but also much easier to reason about when things do start to get weird, um, which is almost a guarantee when you're building big distributed systems on top of big distributed systems, which is kind of what we're aiming for here. Another feature that I'm really excited um, the team are going to start working on very shortly is scriptlets. So this is uh, very, very early days. It's likely that you'll be able to opt into this on a kind of preview basis over the next six months, but this is gonna go be a kind of uh, enduring project that's going to unlock a whole bunch of new capability inside Juju. So what we're essentially doing is aiming to introduce a very small constrained um, scripting interpreter into the Juju controller itself. We're going to use the Starlark language, which is been built for the Bazel project by Google. So Starlark is a language which visually is very, very similar to Python. So for charmed operator developers who are used to writing their charms in Python, Starlark scripts are going to look very, very familiar indeed. But there are some, some fairly critical limitations, which is what allows us to have a very, very tightly constrained interpreter that isn't going to allow, for example, denial of service on the Juju control. So the first piece of work that we need to do is getting the interpreter into the Juju controller and having it suitably constrained. But what it will enable us to do is have an area in the Juju controller where charmed operator developers can run code prior to machine provisioning. So traditionally with Juju, when you deploy an application, you've had to wait for Juju to go, go ahead in the underlying cloud, provision a machine, install the charm software, and then kind of invoke some Python code. That has kind of led to a bit of a chicken and egg problem in some scenarios, particularly on Kubernetes, and this is going to solve that problem. So charm authors will soon be able to, to include very small scripts in their charms that will get run before the charm is even provisioned as part of the controller. So a very obvious example of this is if you are building a Kubernetes charm for an application that has a dependency on a custom resource definition. You can now make sure that that custom resource definition is applied to the Kubernetes cluster before your application pods are even created. You can also use it for programming relations and, and using something called delegated relations, which uh, is something we'll kind of introduce over the next few months. Um, but it'll also introduce kind of templating capabilities, the opportunity for doing data validation in more places. So for example, if you try to integrate two applications together and they happen to speak a slightly different protocol, a script will be able to catch that and kind of reject the operation a little bit earlier on rather than allowing things to go through. So this slide is a little bit abstract, um, but needless to say, the ability to the ability for charm authors to provide little scripts for the Juju controller to run without a machine is going to unlock a whole bunch of new capability. One of the most obvious capabilities there is going to be Juju stacks. So Stacks are essentially the next generation of bundles. It's what bundles always wanted to be, but we never quite pull it off. So right now, if you take Kubeflow, which is 30 something charms, and you deploy that into the model, at the point where that deployment is complete, the, the notion of the bundle kind of dissolves, right? You're just left with a model with 30 charms and a bunch of relations and config. You can't then interact with Kubeflow as a whole again. And the same can be said for observability and any other bundles. The idea behind Stacks is you Juju deploy Kubeflow and what appears in your model is a blob called Kubeflow. And inside that is all of the charms for Kubeflow, right? So it's kind of like, almost like a nested model, a nested scope inside your existing model. The 
the reason scriptlets pay into this is they will enable us to, to unlock kind of a whole like next generation of self-driving software. So for example, let's say you do to deploy Postgres and you scale the Postgres out to three units. So you're running a highly available Postgres uh, with some kind of failover mechanism, some automated backup. The scriptlet will allow you to allow the charm author to specify how to scale. So when I run, you know, Juju add unit Postgres and I want to scale my Postgres up to four or five units, what are the steps I need to take? Right? And, the, and the, the scriptlet inside the stack will be able to kind of orchestrate that in a very, very fine grained way. If we have an application that needs to do, for example, schema migrations, or perhaps uh, when you move an application from kind of single, you know, non-HA mode into HA mode, there needs to be another component alongside it. Well, the script that will be able to take care of that. So it's essentially like a another layer in between the child operator code that runs in machines and pods and the, the operator who's poking buttons on a keyboard. Right. There's something in between that can kind of make decisions and take action on behalf of the user. It'll massively simplify the way that we do integrations. So imagine, you know, in, in a year's time, let's say, you'll be able to Juju deploy Kubeflow, Juju deploy COS, which is our observability stack, and then Juju integrate COS Kubeflow. And all of the things inside Kubeflow that need to talk to Prometheus will instantly be talking to Prometheus. All the things inside Kubeflow that can do log forwarding and talk to Loki will just automatically talk to Loki. So it will really, really simplify the way that you deploy applications and integrate them across different clouds. One of the interesting properties about the way we've designed this is that charms are sort of stacks and stacks are sort of charms, which means that if you're a charm maintainer now and you think you want to take advantage of this, you'll be able to seamlessly kind of upgrade your existing charm to a stack. Just as a, a Juju, you know, Juju refresh, you upgrade the charm and if it needs to grow those capabilities, it will be able to grow them. Okay, so um, if you want to get involved with all of this, there's a few different ways that you can get in touch with us. Obviously, you can keep chatting to us today in the chat on the right-hand side, but you can also head over to charmhub.io, which is where you can find the charm collection and the various bundles that have been published. We've also added topic pages, for example, that do deep dives on observability or machine learning with Juju, so you can take a look through those. We have a, a forum, the discourse forum, so that's discourse.charmhub.io. You can use that for asking questions, um, for contributing to our documentation. We have a kind of request mechanism where if you want to have various charms promoted or published, you can do so through the forum. So it's a really good way to get in touch with the Juju developers themselves, but also the charm teams inside Canonical and, and other community members. If you prefer a kind of more instant messaging type approach, then head over to chat.charmhub.io. There's a whole bunch of channels in there from charm development to duty development itself to kind of topic specific channels like observability, where you can come and talk to the various developers inside and outside Canonical who are using Juju to solve problems and, and kind of get assistance. You'll also learn uh, on the forum and chat about our community workshops that run every Friday. So they are about an hour long. We kind of vary the time zone from week to week, but some of those are kind of deep dives into perhaps a feature like Juju Secrets or a particular method of debugging a charm or some tooling that you might want to pay attention to. You can also check out our public roadmap. Um, so the public roadmap will contain details of the things that we're working on and we'll periodically put status updates in there as to kind of what's what's being worked on, what the progress is, um, that kind of thing. So that's an interesting way to kind of keep track of what we're up to. And that pretty much concludes my talk. So thank you very much indeed. Um, I'm going to hand over to David again, but do please keep asking questions in the chat and I look forward to seeing you on the forum in the Mattermost and beyond.